Being a Better Dungeon Master 3. Rule number two. Every detail you give is one less that they can imagine themselves. Continuing this series, we're going to talk about basically um, the dungeon mastering technique of not giving people more information than they need. Again, if you've watched the previous videos, you understand that the imagination bankruptcy issue, and you'll have to gauge this based on the type of players you have around you. <clears throat> so let's hop to this. The world around you, this is the description that the narrator tends to give on the environment the players are in. You're on a dusty trail, you're in a cave, you're in a village, you're in a particular type of temple or anything like that. Um, younger kids and younger generations that have grown up with computer games that are extremely interactive have a high expectation of details. You know, what color the windows are, how many pews there are, uh, all of these different things. Whereas people who are big fans of books and are, are heavy readers um, probably would, would rather have more freedom to kind of visualize it themselves. Again, as we kind of touched on in earlier videos, that everything in the theater of your mind tends to make sense. It's coherent in of itself. Where every detail you give them, it's one more opportunity for you to kind of conflict with what they would expect. So... Um, you tend to paint yourselves into a corner. That's why I don't like maps and I, I don't like a lot of visuals because you lose flexibility. Once you've told them that the room is 15 by 20 and you put everything on a grid for miniatures and stuff like that, uh, you don't have the opportunity to really give yourself a lot of um, action and, and, and intensity to certain situations because you have to either somehow create that on this physical diagram which it tends to lose that impact so again I'm not a very big fan of maps when I draw maps they tend to look like just a big circle with a squiggly line that leads to yet another circle and kind of like um, I guess the best way to describe it would be linking pieces of paper on a tack board with string the string is three days of travel who cares where it specifically is you just know that they're gonna travel three days on a particular route to get to where they need to go um, the problem with when you use existing worlds, let's say you're going to use Middle Earth, for example, you need to know how many days it is between any three points, and then you've got to figure out, well, wait a minute, no, they can't make it there in six days because it's seven days to this other town, and you, you really paint yourself into that corner, and it's not about simulating a fantasy world. It's about having fun in a fantasy world. You're not doing a simulation, so you shouldn't have to worry about that kind of stuff. Um... Even when it comes to a village, people have these huge, complex maps of a village or a city with hundreds of buildings that they're never going to go in anyway, and it just it doesn't do you any good because, first of all, the characters don't have that map, so you're giving the player more information than the character has. When you walk into, let's say, oh, I don't know, let's say you're from Toronto or you're from Los Angeles, and I dropped you in the middle of St. Paul in Minnesota, you're not going to have any clue whatsoever on where you are, where you're going, what's two blocks down and to the right. But if I had given you a map, then you can plan your escape in a zombie invasion, let's say. But you wouldn't, the characters wouldn't have that map, but you do. So there's a conflict between what the player knows and what the character knows, and it's extremely hard. And as you get older players, it becomes easier um, if they're disciplined. Um, a lot of times, again, most modern people are considerably smarter than an adventure would have been in uh, uh, the days of, let's say, Middle Earth or this, uh, the forgotten ages of, of things like Conan and stuff like that. So I tend to avoid visuals like that because, again, you tend to give the player more information than the character would have. Um, and again, with gaps in the map, so to speak, you can fill that in or shrink it down as you need pacing. If you want to get an adventure done in about an hour, hour and a half, you don't need to role play them walking across an entire city describing, okay, you move three blocks down further and there's three more blocks to go and there's a, a burglar, suspicious looking guy the block over has nothing to do with the story and there's some uh, poor lady sweeping her port. Nobody needs to know that. It, it, it's, it's exposition for the sake of exposition, and you can skip that. And so one of the things I, I, I tell people is just stick with what's needed and use hit lists. 
hit list, just a just a bullet list of things. And like, for instance, here's a in the slide that we've got here, the village. Dirty, thatched roof, worn doors, stone steps, poor on the east side, wealthy on the hill in the north, versus some verbose written thing. And again, for me, it's easy because I just wrote this as I made it up, just going off the hit list. The village is stricken with poverty, dirty thatched roof, homes with time-worn doors, line the streets, broken stone steps provide what, what little aid there is for the elderly. The poorest of the village seem to live on the east side of the town center, yet as you gaze up to the hill and to the north, the homes are clearly owned by the wealthy, gazing down on the slums, whatever. The problem is, is that if you read that, it's going to sound like you're reading it, just as I just did. It's much easier to do that kind of a paragraph or something off the cuff. And it sounds differently when you deliver it. I, I could just as easily read this real quick, Dirty Thatch, Roof, Worn Doors, um, and, and say something to the extent of, as you pass by old worn doors and stone steps of the poor, uh, your eyes travel east uh, to the slums while in the shadow of the wealthy to the north, uh, of the, the the northern hill, uh, your eyes are looking for you know, whatever objective they happen to be looking for. So, um, reading it, it always sounds better than when you say it. That's the problem. So, if you don't have anything to read and you just kind of memorize that as a flashcard and just let it roll off, your personality is going to come better as a DM, and you're not going to over-explain things. They don't need to know how many buildings there are unless they ask you and then you can just tell them there's quite a few don't give them exact numbers there's no point to that um, how many people are in the village man eh, about 300 let's say doesn't matter um, are there people on the streets uh, yeah periodically you see a couple people shuffle by um, mostly busy with going about their business and they pay no heed to you that kind of stuff your job is to, as the narrator portion of this, is to just give them the information they need and give them a feel. Remember, you're more trying to give a mood or a feeling than you are trying to give them a detail. Because if they want a detail, they'll ask for it. Now, what does a sample village uh, look like? Well, here's a, a simple one that I would use. Uh, the village of Tarim. Uh, stucco walls, peaceful children, 300 citizens, central market to the northeast. That's it. That's all I need in the village. I don't need to describe much of anything else. And then there's specific points of interest that we may go over depending on who's in the party. And we, again, in the style that I do, I tend to have the characters make their characters first, and then I write the adventures and campaign to those characters. So I know if somebody's playing a cleric, I might need to add a temple in there. If somebody's playing a thief, I should let them know that there's no thieves guild there and that the town isn't marked to be protected. There are no guards, maybe some petty crime. Uh, there's a market probably for people to do their shopping and that we'll throw that on the west side of the village. There's no magical happenings going on. It's not like it's a village of wizards or anything like that. And some signs that the village has experienced some flooding to give them kind of an idea for uh, the weather. And that may factor into the story. Now, and then I tend to have a skill specific section. Since I already have the character sheets of, of my players, I know exactly what skills they have trained and what skills they don't. And what you should always try to do, no matter how obscure of a skill someone decides to pick, is to make it relevant. So in the skill specific section, you should have at least one skill from each character to give them the opportunity to shine, to have their skill useful. So if somebody takes uh, animal husbandry, um, I don't know, What's the most obscure animal I can think of? Honey badger. Okay, well, maybe the village has a cottage industry of raising honey badgers. You know, make their skills useful. Write them into the story. Remember, you're shaping this adventure and this campaign around your players having a good time. So let your players be clever and have clever responses to what they do. So if the cleric happens to have heraldy skill, give them some some backstory and some detail and some information on what kingdom is it from? Is the governor, according to his coat of arms, related to the royal family? Things of that nature. Herbalism, you know, if somebody is a ranger or they're very good at gathering plants, let's get some plants from the nearby village. What are they useful? What, what does this village have that is of use to people with herbalism skills? You know, maybe they maybe they have none of those skills that they're going to make healing pots out of, but maybe they could dig up some of the roots for money in the next town or city or village that they're passing through. Things of that nature. 
and then curse the people that are in the village that are relevant and important. These, this comes back to the storyteller portion that these are the people that are to carry the plot of the adventure and the campaign forward. We're not big fans of side quests. It tends to distract people. And then again, bullet list, bullet list, bullet list. If they're going to have a discussion with, with, with Groom, the governor, what's the quest? Three kids are missing gathering firewood. That's what we need to convey to the players uh, uh, on how that's going to uh, play out. The players should trust the DM that I'm telling you that three children are missing for a reason, and I expect you to go on this adventure. That's obviously why you're playing. So we don't need to be overly verbose, and we'll get into conversations a little bit, but you would simply say you sit down with the governor, you have a discussion. Uh, after several minutes of the governor getting a feel for you, he reveals to you that three children are missing from the village, and they were gathering last seen you know, firewood in the northern woods. Scanning at my bullet lists. Goblins trying to sell the bugbears. Are you guys searching to find them? Okay. Um, the governor mentions that the hunter, Greston uh, Badage, had seen some odd happenings a, a little bit to the, uh, in a valley near where there's a small creek. It's, you know, you should probably go check with him and he'd probably have some information for you. Um, he also mentions as you leave, by the way, if you do head that way, just keep in mind that there's something kind of not right about that uh, area over there. It's always been kind of a place that most people don't go. That's why the kids were to the north uh, collecting firewood. People tend to stay out of that valley to the east. And then they can go to Greston Badage, you know, and they can go through an adventure in the town trying to figure out where Greston is, have them interact with some random people coming up, you know, the nameless masses of the village, if you would. And they finally find Greston after a while, depending on what you're pacing for. Let's say everybody's going to have lunch in 45 minutes. So you can burn, let's say, 20 minutes for them to find Greston. So have them use their skills, have them use their character classes and try to get a feel for it. And then it all comes back at the temple. Greston Badage is there. He's got a sprained ankle. He's, pressed, he's praying and doing his thing. And he mentions that, yeah, he sprained his ankle to the east on a strange-looking bone totem. Um, Greston's looking very thin, worn, tired. This is a guy that's, you know, had a hard life, and he's got the, kind of the fog of, of time in his eyes. If anybody does detect evil, no, no evil, just, just a dude. Nothing really special about him. Just uh, seems to be getting on, wearing a bit thin, and he's got a sprained ankle. And... He can then give them the strange bone totem and anybody with the appropriate skills. Again, I don't document it there because it's, it's really not important. We're going to let them figure out that the stone, the, the bone totem is basically a goblin totem. So if we want to be specific, we could say that the bone totem is a, a message written in bugbear, for instance. We don't have that specific there, but they, we have that flexibility if we want to work that into the story depending on what the theme is and what kind of feel you're, you're given for them. And again, who the characters are. If somebody happens to read Bugbear, I could add to this before the adventure and say, it's got Bugbear writing on it. So why would a goblin totem have Bugbear writing on it? And then we can kind of work back to what the actual quest is that the goblins are going to try to sell the kids to the Bugbears. The question still remains, why? And... That's going to be on a different page on your adventure itself, your adventure module documentation. But this is just for the village itself. So <clears throat> that gives you kind of an idea. We don't need a lot. And in general, I tend to use those recipe, you know, those four by, what are they, four by three note cards. That should be the sum of a village. And if you need a map, just write it on the back. So again, just to recap that, we just want the raw data on the village. Keep it simple. It should fit probably on a note card. You don't need a map. If you want one, great. I'd suggest just doing a relative diagram, point of interest, line, point of interest, line, point of interest, and so forth. And it gives you a lot of flexibility. Conversations. I can't stress this part enough of this, this video. There is no need for funny voices. Let the players handle how it's going to sound in their head. And this is extremely important. When people start role-playing out, it's to the point where I have an acronym for it. It's GVC sins, goofy voice crimes. Um, 
Great example. Um, character walks into a shop store, calls to the shop owner, and the shop owner shows up. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, I am Dagon Fuglin. Uh, I, how can I help you? And the player is going to probably say something like, yeah, I'm looking for the scroll of ultimate uh, ass-kicking. Oh, I do not have the scroll of ultimate ass-kicking. Not at all. The problem when you do the goofy voice scenario, it, it, it starts out fun for a lot of, especially younger. The problem, though, is, is that you have to convey information in a conversation that you may not be capable of. And in many ways... Um, the worst sin of all is when guys try to talk like women and women try to talk like guys. It's very jarring depending on how good of a session you're having. But more so, it, it makes um, adversarial conversations extremely difficult. If I am somehow trying to talk to a shop owner and I'm trying to haggle the shop owner's price down right, as a player... When I try to role play out that conversation between the shopkeeper, who's going to be played by the DM, and then the player themselves, how does the player make a good argument for lowering that price? What if the player isn't a very good salesman or very good at haggling for prices, but his character is? There's a disconnect between the player and the character and the DM and the, the characters that the DM has to assume. It's much better... In my opinion, again, these videos are my opinion. By, by all means, don't take them as gospel. But it's easier to simply say, I approach the shopkeeper um, and aggressively try to negotiate down the price as a player. I don't have to do goofy voices. I don't care what gender the shop owner is. And the DM can say, okay, make a an appraisal check. All right, I make an appraisal check. And it's... Let's put it at DC 10 for the first round. Okay. I make my roll. Uh, roll to 13. Okay. The conversation's going very well. Um, a couple more attempts and you probably can get yourself a 10% discount. But there's the risk that the conversation could go south fast. This merchant is very shrewd and knows what you're trying to do. The question is, is who is the better negotiator? That type of a conversation structure works much better. And the point that we're going to uh, bring up here in the slide, which is a, a very good one, the old woman comes up to you crying and screaming. Anguish drips from her words as she begs you for help. This conveys much better emotional information than some DM trying to go, Oh God, help me, help me, my children are missing. No, that, me doing that sounds stupid and conveys none of the emotional requirement that we're actually trying to convey. And it, it, it's more emotional impact, for the older players especially. For the younger players, it's you may want to do it for your first couple of years. I, again, I'm not going to tell you how to, how to play. I'm just giving you suggestions in, these, in this video series. But it is much more efficient and uh, considerably easier. Now, if you're going for Goofy and you're having a much more lighthearted campaign and stuff where uh, uh, Goofy voice crimes are, are contributing, then fine, knock yourself out. But uh, it's a breeze. Avoid GVCs. This also comes, again, as I used in my original uh, example, when haggling with merchants or trying diplomacy or uh, trying to use a, 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 a disguise skill or trying to... Um, you know, uh, negotiate anything in the game mechanics, keeping the conversations uh, out of the first and second person is much more effective. Third person conversations are considerably easier um, in that sense. And just keeping the details down. If you do that, it allows the player in their head more imagination to be able to really kind of... Um, visualize that and imagine that on their own uh, and just have a better experience in general. Combat. Combat is continuous. Turns are just the highlights. This is a, a style that grew out of a lot of role-playing game systems that I've played in the past where everything is happening simultaneous. Um, the idea is that combat is kind of like a movie and everything's kind of going around 
And when your turn comes up, that's when we're hitting pause. And we're going to make a change. Um, it's really, you're assuming that in combat, everybody is kind of doing stuff the entire time. Not everybody's just sitting there standing and it's like, it's his turn. I can't do anything right now. No, that doesn't work. Everybody should be in motion and moving. It should be a, like your best favorite fight scene in a film. And when your turn comes up, that what, they're, what we're really saying is, is this is your opportunity to shine. Or this is the opportunity for the enemy to shine. This is where you do something that's going to affect the outcome of the fight. And... So in that sense, we want to keep people nebulous and not in a specific location at any point in time. That's why I don't like using maps. When you use a map, you're locking people into position and you're forcing the story, the gameplay, the content, and the experience to be in lockstep. You go, I go, he goes. You go, I go, he goes. It really isn't how it works. But if we assume everybody is in motion and everybody is doing stuff and then our turn comes up and that's where we're going to really shape the outcome of all that generic stuff going on then yeah so the example I use is let's imagine there's uh, five goblins fighting and there's three or four players going on we don't know at any point in time until someone's turn comes up where everybody is this is the advantage of not using a map what we're going to say is that everybody's in motion. Let's say it's a 20 by 20 room. At any point in time, we don't know where anybody is. Somebody's turn comes up, and then we kind of freeze the combat. And we can kind of gauge where everybody is at that moment. And the two-thirds rule that I use is let's assume that out of three creatures, the any player at any time should be able to get access to two of them either in melee range or at range or in some circumstances. Now, the DM might have a map of the, of the combat kind of to keep track of things, just a couple checkers on a checkerboard or something like that. But basically, if I have five goblins there and I use the two-thirds rule, I can roughly say two or three of them are within range of a particular player that wants to do something. And this goes a long way. So, you know, the fight's going on. Okay. Bill, you're up. Um, as you scan the room, your warrior is within easy shot of two of the goblins. There's a third goblin you could probably hit. He's a little bit out of range. You'd probably take a negative two to your strike roll, but you could probably get to him too. This is an advantage. This gives the DM the ability to give players bonuses or penalties to control the pacing, to make the fight heroic, to make the players look like they've got huge impact on this moment. And it helps you shape, you know, if, for instance, if a goblin is full on life, I can put him closer to the player and then put the most wounded one further out if I want to get the players to whittle the goblins down faster. They still have control. The dice roll still determines their success or failure. What I'm doing is I'm just adjusting the pacing uh, for them to feel like they've accomplished something. So in that, you need to understand what your players are like. If somebody is all creepy and sneaky, you need to set up moments where he can be creepy and sneaky. If somebody is bold and brave, then you need to be able to set up opportunities for him to be bold and brave. And when that comes out, um, you as the DM tend to play out the results. So when the player's turn comes up, let's say they're a wizard, they're going to cast Magic Missile. Okay, they cast Magic Missile, fine. And they're going to do the roll. Okay, um, you hit, you do your damage roll. I did seven points of damage. Okay, this is where the DM naturally tends to take over. Because we're going to play it out, as we'll use the term, the DM tends to play it out. And he's going to say, okay, um, let's say the wizard's name is Gary. Gary, as you scan around the room, you see three goblins within range. They're about ready to pummel the living crap out of uh, Jeff. 
Uh, what do you do? Oh, I do my magic missile. I hit for seven damage. Okay. Well, as the energy erupts from your fingertips, the bolts fly out, striking one of the goblins clean in the face. His face, burning and scarred with magical energy, reels back away from Jeff, trips over a bar stool, scurries at, uh, against the wall. You've done seven damage points to him. He looks to be in pretty rough shape. That's where the DM tends to play it out. And depending on your crowd, if they get it, you can let them do it, and they'll tend to take... The longer you play with them, the more they tend to do that themselves. The idea is it's always open and close. Whatever we do in this moment is resolved. It's not going to really carry over unless we, we need it to. So that goblin isn't going to be on the floor next turn. He, we're going to assume in the flow of combat that he's gotten back up and we end up getting ourselves into another situation. So it's kind of... Um, <clears throat> A good example is comic books. In many ways, this functions a lot like a comic book, is that we're seeing, when your turn comes up, a single pane of the fight. Not the whole fight. There's stuff that happens in between each frame. So we're getting that kind of biff, baff, pow. If you ever remember the old uh, uh, Batman and Robin series from the 60s, um, it's basically we're playing out the those big hits. Now, if you tend to do that, and you're the DM and you tend to play it out, make sure you bring those characters to life as best as you can based on the precedent that the, the, the characters have, have shown already. So if the paladin is always going, for great justice, and then smashes something in the face, then when you're the DM, you should probably try to bring that out as well. It's a moment for the player and the characters to step apart from each other, and the DM breathe a little life into the character independent of the player. And that can be fun for players. For some, if they're control freaks, they don't want that at all. They want to play it out. Then you let them do that. So, and again, here's a, a good example that we have in the slide. Again, player, uh, now the name is Scotty. I smashed the goblin in the face with my mace for six damage. Versus just telling me that I hit for six, which is fucking boring. I swear to God, I want to choke players like that. Just at least give me something to work with. So then the DM's got to play it out. Okay, now since he's already told me he smashed the goblin in the face with a mace for six damage, I can just chain off of that and say, with a face full of steel, uh, the goblin goes creeping over the table and slams into the coat rack. A lone pink scarf falls to adorn him. And then I just note that one of the goblins has a pink scarf. Um, and then I assign that goblin six damage. Now, the advantage is, is I've made a visual cue that there is a specific goblin with a specific pink scarf, and I can just bring that out as necessary. Um, then, as the combat rages, Dorian, you're up. In other words, I've looked at the initiative list, and the player Dorian is now up. It's his turn. Again, I take a snapshot of the fight that's raging around, and I say, you clearly see an opportunity to hit three of the goblins, one of which happens to look quite fashionable in pink. So I've told them that there's two other goblins, and then also the pink goblin. Well, the one that's wearing pink, I should say. This is a cue. I can give him a hint that, hey, if you want to try to finish off this one goblin that you know you've damaged in the fight, there's a good opportunity if you want to finish him out, or you can start working on the other two. Dorian decides, I cast Magic Missile at the Goblin in Pink, does his rolls, I hit for seven. Okay, now, let's let the player play it out. Well, he's going down, Dorian. Tell me how. Now, Dorian is the more creative player. He's like, the Goblin's hour is nigh. Bursting from my fingertips, a volley of Magic Missiles strike the Goblin, as the snapping of bone can clearly be heard echoing through the room. The Goblin slumps to the ground with his last this last moment in disgust, now realizing that he was wearing the pink scarf. And he dies. So, uh, that's an example of a player playing it out. And there's give and take and flow. But if there's a circumstance that comes up, let's say you, the goblin's going to get knocked out a window. Then I would probably, before Dorian goes all crazy with his description, is I just go, I got this. Dorian should trust the DM that the reason I'm taking control away from him in, this, in playing it out is because I need to do something that is going to affect the, the combat uh, on a larger scale. So instead of, let's say he does Magic Missile again, I, says, uh, I would say, well, Dorian, your Magic Missiles fly out with such ferocity, it strikes the next goblin, sending him up into the air and smashing through a window. 
Then Dorian might say, eh, I blow the glitter off my fingertips. Booyah. Whatever the personality requires. So, um, and again, we'll, we'll recap here in this last bullet point, is that when you have that nebulous combat uh, feel going, it's easier for you to give people opportunities to be heroic. Uh, again, with the Scotty example that we've got here, all right, Scotty, you're up as you scan the battle. You find the ogre currently uh, dealing with Dorian. Dorian just had dodged a poorly executed headbutt from the ogre, whose head is now sampling the great flavors of dwarvish ale fresh from the keg, which is around said ogre's head. So, you now have plus five to strike uh, at that ogre if you so choose, and the ogre cannot make an attack of opportunity because he's busy. So, what this advantage of this style of combat and storytelling and stuff like that is, is that if I want the ogre to die because this fight is just dragging on and the players aren't cutting it for the rolls for whatever reason, I can give them easier ability to have extra armor class. You're at the opposite end of a, a large table. The ogre is at the other end of the table. Uh, he's within striking distance, but because of the table being in the way, he's going. you're going to be considered soft cover. You have plus three to your armor class. Or I can say he's negative three to his attack rolls. Um, I could say um, because of the smoke in the room, uh, nobody is going to be able to make critical strikes because everybody's choking on... on soot and ash and, and smoke so um, that can make it safer or more dangerous you tend not to make things more dangerous again if anything should kill the player it should be their own dice rolls however making things easier um, more often than not is is acceptable and your players as you understand trust and things of that nature um, you'll be able to have a little more flexibility on making things more dangerous because it should always be dangerous. Combat should always have a chance of death. Always. The question is, is it should always depend on the players screwing up versus you kind of cheating defeat to them. Um, players should always understand and feel that if they're going to die, it's because they didn't make the rolls needed. And if they're making the rolls and they're kicking ass, then they should win. It should be that simple. Um, if they're botching the rolls constantly and you want to make the fight more dramatic, drag it out. Uh, fudge damage. You know, instead of the, the orc hitting for six, make him hit for two. You know, drag that out. Make him bleed, in other words. If players are losing, make them bleed. And I don't mean literally, you know, the, the game effect bleed. I mean... Make sure the player takes a Rocky Balboa beating. Because if you're losing at least, then make them, make it heroic in the fact that they're taking that much abuse. So then that gives them the opportunity in the 15th round to, to come back and make the knockout, so to speak. Um, that's an opportunity there. So um, if you do like using maps... What I tend to suggest is randomizing people's locations between each round of combat. Um, if you have, uh, for instance, like an old Warhammer die that has a, a, an arrow on it, um, you can use that or roll a d4 for north, south, east, west, um, and then just move everybody around in the, in the room. So in other words, okay, so we've completed a round of combat, a whole bunch of miscellaneous bullshit happens in the fight, and this is where everybody ends up now at the start of the next round. And all this other stuff has happened that really didn't affect the outcome of the fight, but has happened nonetheless. And depending on your pace and your time, you could actually, you know, play that out. You know, you could explain why uh, Dorian is now clear across the room and this goblin is over here and maybe uh, there's another dead goblin up in the chandelier for a bizarre reason, you know. However over the top you want to make it. And that's always a good opportunity, and it makes things, again, interesting. We come back to knowing your player to kind of bring this video to an end here, but you have to understand what your players expect of you and what they want and how much control they want. You're going to have your Scotty versus Dorian crowd. Um, and the longer you play with players, they tend to gravitate more towards the Dorian player in this particular example. 
um, and understand the idea of combat. Players are going to be like, if they're especially hardline board game style uh, role players, they're going to be like, well, why would I end up, you know, 12 squares over here and, and three over there? I don't want to go over there. And it's simply the circumstances have brought you to that location. If you dodged and you really wanted to be a simulation player, you would probably have to pick a direction to dodge too. Are you going to dodge to the left or are you going to dodge to the right? Okay, now you have to move your figurine over to that square. All right, now you have an attack of opportunity, and he's going to do it his attack of opportunity. Okay, you dodged again, and so forth and so forth. When people lean on the rules heavily, it usually is because they don't want to lose or they want a strategic advantage. And you're not playing a strategy game, you're playing a role-playing game. If you want strategy, trust me, chess is a much better alternative. But what I find is is that people that crutch on rules uh, do so out of, I wouldn't say mistrust. Um, they are more interested in the mechanics of the game than they are in the, in the role-playing part of that. And I get that a lot from people that play computer games. Um, <clears throat> book heavy people don't seem to have a problem with this style uh, computer game heavy people do they really don't like it because they want to play a strategy game they want to take a role playing game and turn it into a uh, pen and paper version of Final Fantasy Tactics so you need to understand very clearly on, on the type of players you're dealing with and how you implement styles and rules and things of that nature with it I, I dislike the board game players, as I call them. Um, which, again, there's nothing wrong with that style of play. It's just it's one that I don't prefer. Um, and part of that comes out in, in... Oh... I would suppose largely um, because they want to have a specific distance between a particular mob. But when you take the distances out of it and you just let them know... Uh, what they want to do. If they want to focus on a particular mob, let's say they're trying to finish off, um, I don't know, a particular ogre. You shouldn't make that ogre go out of the distance in, in, in our style of, of combat. If they want to focus on somebody, they should be able to. They should be able to keep them in range. If somebody wants to stay out of range of someone, then unless circumstances warrant it, then they should be able to stay out of it. Um, it it's, it's not about randomizing who they get to fight with. It's just uh, uh, keeping that flow and everybody moving around and it should be kind of like a, a what was that movie uh, gladiator with Russell Crowe it should be that shaky cam combat moment you know where everybody's all over the place nobody can really keep track of what's going on everybody's trying to desperately just make it out alive versus some lockstep okay you move okay you get to turn attack cast okay next move turn attack cast believe me I love Final Fantasy Tactics I like Wak Fu. Yeah, I've played Wak Fu. I've played Vandal Heart. I like strategy RPGs on a computer. I don't like them when I'm role playing. There's a difference, and there's a different circumstance for that. So, keeping that in mind, and that, that's by and large the bulk of this. Um, outside of that, it's what are the expectations we have um, in keeping the amount of information flowing. I don't want to dwell too much on combat, but Going back to even describing towns and, and describing events and things like that, your first objective is fun. Know what's fun for your players. Know what's fun for yourself. I can't stress this enough. You are on equal footing with your players. Whether you have five players or three players or two players or just one other player, you are 50% of the entertainment value of this. They're the other 50%. And if it's not fun for you as the DM, make it fun for you. You're 50% of this. You're not, if there's five players and one DM, you're not one sixth of this. You're 50% of it because you're the guy that's got to do all the work. All they have to do is show up. So put your players on one side of the page, put yourself on the other side of the page, and make sure you're having just as much fun as those other players. It's not, it's, this is not a social service. You're not volunteering your time. It's not a donation. It's, it's, it's not charity. You're doing it so you can have a good time as well. 
And your players need to understand that. And that these tools and these rules are to give everybody enough flexibility to make it fun for everyone. The less information you provide, the less likely you are to paint yourself into a corner where people start rule mongering and bitching about, well, wait a minute, it was three days to get here. Why is it four days to get back? I don't know. Maybe you're taking a different route. Maybe the weather's bad. You should just trust the DM if he says it takes you four days to get back. It takes you four days to get back. Use your goddamn imagination and fill in the blanks yourself why it takes an extra day. Maybe your legs are sore. Maybe you pulled a hamstring. Do you really need to go into that much nitpicking bullshit? No, you don't. That's the problem. You're not making a simulation. You're having fun playing a game. Let your imagination fill in the blanks. Really, don't be a rule monger. It doesn't help. It never does on the other side of the fence. So, another reason why I like this style, and this does touch back to combat, is, well, dinner's ready, time for pizza run, I gotta take the dogs out, whatever, you can stop and come back. You don't have to worry about where all the miniatures were. Okay, uh, we gotta wrap this up, guys, and I'll see you uh, next Thursday. No miniatures, no map shit, no where was I, was I two feet from the, the tour, it doesn't matter. We can just come back, you start the next combat round, you're good to go. You know how many creatures are alive, and that's all you need. So it's much more stop and go compatible. So I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, again, I'm trying to keep these under an hour, and uh, I wish I could keep them more around 30 minutes, but it's just it's too much to cover in general. Uh, hope you enjoyed this. Uh, again, it's out there basically just trying to educate people and preserve some of that art. Um, if you subscribe, you subscribe. If you don't, you don't. I ain't going to lose sleep over it. So good luck, ladies and gentlemen, and don't do stupid shit on the Internet. Everybody's watching.